Today is Friday, November 3rd, and here again with Josh. How are you doing, Josh? I am doing well. Uh, I just wanted to start off uh, with a uh, couple of little things from previous episodes. Uh, there was an episode where I was talking about the relationship between uh, our giant brains and how much energy they need from their mothers, and I vastly over-exaggerated the amount of fat in uh, human milk. Uh, oh. I, the way I tend to uh, think about facts and figures is I, I remember them in relationships, and so I knew that uh, human milk uh, fat was twice that of cows, which is important, right? And and basically was the thing I was trying to talk about was how much how much energy we give to our babies. But I uh, overestimated the cows and then overestimated humans. So anyway, I just I just wanted to correct that. Uh, our, our human milk fat comes in around um, uh, uh, 6% or so, 6 or 7%, not 18 as I said. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank yeah. you for correcting me. Uh, and then the other thing was uh, last last uh, uh, evening, I uh, did a show on uh, serpentinization and I just wanted to point out that was uh, an experiment using my, um, using my phone, uh, sitting there with a, a cat on my lap and uh, uh, I definitely went far afield from uh, my normal areas of expertise. So if any of the chemistry turns out to be wrong, I will try and check it out and uh, get corrections and follow later up times. On that and follow course. up on that. Right. And I'll probably be coming back to serpentinization at, at some point. There's there's vastly more to the topic. And, and I and I do hope that that as you have uh, more ideas that you you need to get off your chest. Uh, when you're not with me, that you will continue to do short yeah. recordings on your own because we'll we'll put those up. That 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 is the goal. And and right. just just for those who don't know what I'm talking about, serpentinization makes hydrogen that comes directly out of the ground, and we can run our entire economy on it perfectly cleanly and produce zero so pollution. Why are we not doing that? I guess that's because a we just discussion. found it, and that's what we that will be the next you know, okay, kind okay. of thing we so talk about. Yeah. Moving on to today's. All discussion. right, moving on to today's discuss, discussion. Um, there's been a couple of articles recently uh, in the New York Times on art and uh, on sort of our relationship in the modern world to art. And I've, I found them interesting. And so I wanted to do a um, basically a, an art history talk, but from the point of view of human evolution. So starting with the beginning of human art and then just bringing us right through to what we're talking about today. I can't wait to hear how you define the beginning of human art. Um, well, that's super easy. It's sort of a hashtag. Um, it, uh, so yeah, so, um, what I was, what I was reading about was that, uh, the art we have in the modern world has become, uh, outside of time. It's atemporal, uh, that we no longer have a, a, a firm standing in any particular, uh, era. And that this has happened really across the board. I can see it in my own music. So I, I look at the music I listen to and it's from the 1930s up till yesterday. And it's this whole range. And what is that range? That's modernity, right? So uh, just between the wars, right? That the at, at, After World War I, basically uh, visual arts all change uh, and uh, music starts to change. And this is when the birth of modernity, we no longer have the classical image of the guy on a horse with a sword, right? That, 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 that goes away. We lose classical music. Uh, we lose classical poetry. And then these were replaced by new forms. And these new forms are changing all the time. And so we go through these upheavals over and over again as, as, as visual arts change, as, as music changes, and it happens more and more rapidly. And then in the last real, really decade, uh, we've gone outside of time itself. We are now in a region where everything is a giant jumble and happening at the same time. And so uh, the the thesis that was in the Times was that this is, means that um, our art itself has become confused and will not leave anything for future generations that will make any sense because it's from all different times and that we as a time may not be remembered because of this because we are now essentially ahistorical. We've left, a, we have no way to define ourselves. Yeah, we are not a time. Uh, okay, so in, in some ways... I agree with this, uh, but I think that is actually a definition. Uh, this is this okay. is a moment unlike others, and yeah. so therefore this is a moment. Uh, and this kind of contradiction is 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 constant in the art world. As soon as you uh, destroy something, you basically created the thing that you just destroyed. Right. Uh, and the destruction itself is a thing. Is a thing and becomes a, you know the next the next thing. The next thing. So yeah. So so the thing we're in right now is this 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 atemporal moment. Uh, and so I wanted to think about what time is in relation to art and, and, you know, go back to the beginning of art time 
and then forward again and see sort of how we got to some of this. Was, was this the thesis of the article that you were reading that, that our art right now is outside of time? Yes. And we're not definable and won't be remembered because yes. of that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that was the thesis. And, and I agreed with it. Um, I, I, I think it's true. And then I think the opposite of it, because it's true, this is our time. Mm. This is the moment, right? Mm-hmm. And so the, the, this, this is, this is the, the sort of the nature of defining things within art is as soon as you've defined something, you've moved to another step, essentially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that step we're in right now is a moment. So mm-hmm. we're outside of time, but happening within time. Our, mm-hmm. our, our time is atemporal. You can actually be outside of time, but yes. Right, no, so, yeah. so you can access things from any time at any moment, anywhere, mm-hmm. right? This is the nature of the modern information world. Um, so going back to the beginning, uh, we've just become humans. Our brain is expanding. Uh, our, um, uh, the, the regions of our brains that govern both tools and language have expanded. So the left hemisphere is much larger than the right. We've become right-handed. We've become skilled with tools. We're making new tools. And we see this explosion in, uh, in, in new technologies, which I've already talked about, things like fish hooks and needles that require imagination. At this moment, we find in South Africa an 80,000-year-old cave with, as I said, a hashtag. Someone made a sort of scratch in a piece of ochre. They were probably using it to make body paint, and they happened to make a pattern out of it while they did it, right? So they, they didn't just scratch it. They did it in both directions. Mm. Um, so it wasn't just random? It wasn't just random. Right. Now, we would clearly had an aesthetic sense even before that. As soon as I'm sorry, the, the, my, my, I have a question, which is that you don't think that that pattern was you don't think that that pattern was actually the purpose of the art. The, the it was a byproduct, and that they were trying to get a pigment for body paint. Probably because what 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 is found next to this piece of ochre, which is a stone, and then you can scratch the stone to get pigment from it. What is found next to it is a uh, abalone shell with with pigment in it right okay. so someone was collecting this pigment and then putting it basically in a palette there's no paint on the walls so the high idea is that what were they painting they were probably painting themselves Very interesting. and it, it's fun to do i mean i i did this as a, as a child i would go down to the beach i would take red stone scratch the ochre off of it and paint myself with it mm-hmm. all the kids did yeah because if you live near those rocks that's what you do um, but I didn't tend to make patterns with it. And if I had made a pattern while I was doing it, that would have been art. It's not high art. It would have been, you know, very beginning kind of thing. But it's something that would leave a mark, right? You, you scratch into a rock, it's there for a really long time. In this case, 80,000 years. Just <laughs> sitting there. No one touches it. There it is. You pick it up 80,000 years later. So this is what I wanted to get at is sort of the, the sense of deep time and the beginning of art. Um, even before that, when we were making hand axes... Uh, there would have been some sort of uh, concept involved. So if art is anything, it's uh, modification of some sort of substance uh, or the modification, uh, you know, production, say, of song or sounds, right? It's, it's, it's doing something that wasn't there before uh, and then with some sort of way of conveying information to someone else. Uh, so that uh, before this hashtag, um, that hashtag would just say, look, here I am doing this thing, right? It's, it's a pattern. And so we generally think of this as associated with um, these advanced technologies, fish hooks, probably the development of language. Before this, what we had was hand axes. And with, for a hand axe, this is a, this is a stone tool about the size of a cell phone. Uh, for the same reason, you hold them in your hand. Uh, and we probably would have been able to do a hand axe without too much advanced language. You can just sit next to someone and learn how to make something like that. Uh, So communication could have happened direct sort of body-to-body communication, just following the patterns. Uh, And when the hand axes were made, they had a certain aesthetic value to them. They might have stripes in them. Sometimes there'd be a fossil that was put directly in the center of the hand axe so that you could see it. Uh, So it wasn't that we were outside of aesthetics, but we were not making these things for an aesthetic reason. So they're not considered art. And they don't have the same kind of meaning that a symbol or a pattern put on a wall or put on a stone purposely does, right? So that piece of ochre was not a tool. It was not for anything else. It was just scratched. Now, it might have been used to make the pigment, but when they did it, 
they were making a pattern. And so that's sort of the, the very, very beginning. And coupled with this, uh, with the uh, abalone shell with the pigment in it, gives the idea that we were painting ourselves. We were doing something with this pigment. So it's not just the hashtag. Yeah, we weren't just scratching away. We right. were collecting it yeah, for so a purpose. The whole, the whole sort it was, of. It was part of a multi-step process. And, 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 our, and our pieces of evidence showing that this was art. Um, and so this was a, a, a real transition from we might have been able to appreciate pretty things before this. But now we're making things that have a meaning, that have some way of conveying something. Now, it might just be I have red on my face. So, you know, this is a special moment, right? I, I made red on my face. I look cool now, right? There, 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 there could be all sorts of reasons you might want to paint yourself. It could be rituals uh, or it could just be, uh, you know, early makeup, right? Uh, my, 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 my children played around with this. If they wanted to put rouge on their cheeks, they would actually scratch some ochre and put some rouge on their cheeks. Uh, you know, these, 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 these are things humans have done for a long time and they, they have to do with, um, you know, our relationship to each other and uh, putting marks on ourselves. Uh, but again, it has to do with, with um, both a combination of beauty and, uh, and, and communication. And maybe a little bit of controlling our world. Controlling the world, yes. So that's, that's, that's sort of the thing that comes later. As soon as you have a, a, a symbology, you can, you can record your world, you can control yeah, your world. Even the, the act of marking yourself. Absolutely, controlling yeah. Controlling things in a way that never was possible before. Yeah. So the first thing we start to see on cave walls is handprints. So we take, we take that mark on ourselves, and then we put it onto the cave wall. And so this is, this is our signature, essentially. And you know, so I ask my students, um, you as a human, why would you put your handprint somewhere? And I show them pictures of, of modern graffiti, of handprints on things. And they're saying, well, just essentially I was here. And I think, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, but sometimes there, there's weird ones, right? You might be part of a, of a cult or a group. So people will make the equivalent of gang symbols, uh, you know, different weird finger combinations and put those on a wall. Mm -hmm. And so that's a particular signature. There's one place in North Africa where they have human handprints and then the handprint of a very large lizard put directly over the human handprint. Um, you can't say why, but that was a group that had a particular thing going on. You can't say why, but it certainly says something. Says something, it yes. It definitely you know, says something. I am the Lizard King, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, there's... I had this lizard in my hand. Yeah, a very big yes. lizard. And they're not all the same lizard. And a lot of people are doing this at different times. So they were the lizard people. <laughs> right. So there is, this, this, this becomes, you know, one of the, the first aspects of art is marking that you were here. Um, when we start to see what we call uh, true cave art, uh, parietal art, the art that is painted on a wall. Uh, so um, once, once that begins and we start to actually paint animals and things like that, we've, 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 we've truly entered the world of abstraction. And um, until relatively recently, we had understood this as happening in Europe. It was probably for uh, some perhaps slightly, ever so slightly racist reasons. Uh, anytime you look back in uh, anthropology and archaeology, as soon as you get back into the 50s and 40s, the stuff you see is unbelievably racist. Even if they have a reasonable uh, 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 theory on something, they'll just throw in a couple of racist words just for fun. Uh, and, and you're like, why did you even do that? Right? So, you know, for example, someone uh, found hand axes uh, all the way to India and then none in China. And so they could have just said that, but they're like, well, maybe the people in China weren't smart enough. Just, just throw that out there. And they're not even talking about humans, right? We're talking about, uh, uh, you know, Homo erectus in different regions. And, and, and they just, just throw it out there for, a, 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 you know, basically racist reasons. So we're finding uh, all this art in Europe. We also find art in other parts of the world, but we assume it's not as old because it's not in Europe. And it was a somewhat of a, of, of a sort of, yeah, exactly. Uh, and so there was this, 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 this self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, it wasn't entirely for racist reasons. If you think about the European art, what do you see on the walls? You see woolly mammoths. You see woolly rhinos. You see things that don't exist anymore. So you know they must have been real. So as soon as we saw, we didn't have to be, you know, experts at dating. You see a mammoth painted on the wall, say, you know, it's 1850 or something. And you're like, oh, that's old. We don't have those anymore. That's incredible. That's like an elephant with fur on it. And so we knew that these were incredibly old. When you go see the ones that were done in Indonesia or in Malaysia that are actually potentially older, but we've only recently realized this, they're the same animals that are there today. So you can't just look at them and realize they're old. So it wasn't entirely racism. It's not always racism, but there's always just a sprinkling mm -hmm. of it, particularly in the earlier stuff. And, and that we hadn't been really thinking about it that way. We just made these assumptions. It wasn't in Europe. 
must not be old. So uh, what happened was they started uh, they started peeling off layers of the calcium carbonate that comes from the caves. And they were able to separate those layers and find the bottom layer, so microscopic stuff, and then get the um, uranium byproducts out of that bottom layer that would give you an accurate date. And they discovered that these things in Sulawesi in Malaysia were 40,000 years old or older. You're talking about the bottom layer of pigment on the stone. No, the, the bottom layer of stone over the pigment. So there, as a cave is forming, the water is dripping down and evaporating, le leaving calcium carbonate. Now, if there was a lot of it, you wouldn't see the painting anymore. Right. It would be covered. So we're talking very microscopic, transparent layers. When you put those under a microscope, you can see individual layers of this stuff, like, like, like paint layers, like you know, someone would paint it and then they'd paint again. The people pry these things apart. You then have minuscule, minuscule samples, but you're looking for radioactive isotopes. Again, so less than, you know, one part per million of this tiny thing you just did is going to be the isotope you're looking at. You're measuring picograms, femtograms. But you're, then once you find that, you've absolutely you know, dated it. You absolutely dated. It must be older than this thing, right? Because the layers of stone were over it. And it's very easy to get younger dates, but you can't get older dates because it was under a layer of stone. Mm -hmm. So your all your errors are going to be towards the younger end. Uh, and so it, it's a really like uh, firm way to say it must be older than a particular date. And so uh, these dates are 40,000 years, 45,000 years, uh, predating some of the European art, really most of the European art. So it turns, but we've only known this about 2008, 2010. This, so this is this is brand new stuff that we've been finding out, and it's changing our concept. So any 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 racist idea that art began in Europe is totally false. While we were leaving Africa, we were painting everything. Uh, we also <laughs> we also don't find a lot of we were killing and painting everywhere we went. Exactly, and so we don't find a lot of this stuff in Africa, um, mostly because there weren't caves of the right type. Now it may turn out that some of these African paintings that we thought were young for the same reasons, right? We just assumed may well be very old and they may be going back much further in time. Uh, the ones that we found from 80,000 years ago in South Africa are almost the only evidence of very early cave art in Africa. I bet you could find things from 80,000 years and 70 and 60 and 50 because then we have it at 40 in Indonesia, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's out there somewhere. We just haven't found it yet. And so we, we have to just sort of leave behind the idea that U Europe is where art happened, mm -hmm. right? It's just that there was a lot of really great caves in the limestone of, 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 of uh, where sort of Spain, France, uh, start and, not, and not Italy just, all come not together. Not for people to be in, but for art to be preserved. For art to be preserved, right. If you're, if you're just on the, uh, uh, if you're painting on a wall, even with a little ledge over it, that's not going to survive. It's got to be down, it's got to be in deep within the caves. Uh, and it's, and it's got to be in some way protected from bats. Uh, apparently, uh, bats getting into a cave tends to degrade it. Um, now, a lot of the early theories are why did we only paint really deep in the caves? I'm beginning to think that we painted everywhere and only the stuff really deep in the caves survived. And mm -hmm. so there was a lot of talk about these ritual spaces. I agree. They were ritual spaces. They were really hard to get deep in the caves to paint these things. And how did you get to paint on the ceiling and all these kinds of things? All of these things took a lot of work. You had to do it by torchlight. They were very, very deep in caves interesting ritual spaces that I, I will definitely do, be talking about. But I think the stuff in the front of the caves was there too, and the bats got there and just destroyed it. So uh, I, I think there's sampling bias in a lot of what we do. You know, it, it can only occur in certain kinds of I mean, caves. If, you, if, you, if you've ever been to Pompeii, you see that every wall that exists, every surface was colored, everything. Right, right. So this is, this is, this is an instinct. It gives us joy to make art, right? And that is, that is something that I have uh, accentuated in, uh, or I've, I've tried to um, uh, have some theme uh, when I talk about things. Things that evolution likes to select for give us joy, right? Mm -hmm. Running around and throwing stuff gives us joy. Uh, painting gives us joy. Uh, talking to people gives us joy, right? These are things uh, that, that is selected for. Obviously, uh, you know, a relationship with a member uh, uh, of the opposite sex you're attracted to gives us joy because evolution really likes to select for that. Mm -hmm. But these are all things that are, that are, that are naturally uh, occurring things that give us joy. Now, not everything that gives us joy is good for us, right? Evolution wants us to eat lots of sugar and fat. Also brings us joy, right? Literally, our dopamine and serotonin levels go up when we eat sugar and fat. 
not necessarily good for us. Luckily, art is somewhat good for us because we'd be doing it anyway, right? You, you tell the kids in your class not to draw on the desk and they're all scraping with their knives every time the teacher's back is, you know, put their initials knives. on something. Knives. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I'm thinking high school, you know, like carving on the bottom of a desk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, my, my, seriously, my students, none of them have knives. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 meant, I mentioned games that involve throwing knives to my students and none of them had ever heard of anything of remotely not. like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, some of it's a different era. You know, I was I was I was taught by people who had like grown up in the forties and fifties that throwing knives was a perfectly normal game. There was a thing called lawn darts and mumbledy peg. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, these things are past. Uh, we live in a different era now. Uh, but uh, you know, throwing stuff is still fun. Yeah. Uh, anyway, back to art. Um, so uh, what we understand as uh, the history of art is basically defined by uh, European periods. Uh, but that's only because we've only recently started to understand that it's not the rest of the world. Uh, that, I mean, that art is in the rest of the world and that uh, there are overlaps between these regions and periods and, and productions. But I'm going to give you the sort of general, let's say, year 2000 version of how we would have understood art art to be produced. You know, think, things are changing because of these new dating systems. We know it was everywhere. But um, the earliest kinds of art you see in Europe uh, are from about 40,000 years ago, and they are what are known as uh, the Venus figures. There's some discussion whether you should call them that, but there's certainly these uh, 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 apparently ritualistic figures. They tend to be uh, voluptu voluptuous women, often without heads or with, that, with, with their head features somewhat uh, uh, de-emphasized, large hips, large breasts, looking like uh, some sort of uh, fertility symbol. Uh, we get our ideas of what a fertility symbol is from some of these images. You're saying these particular images are from about 40,000 years ago? The Europe. very earliest ones, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 40,000, 30,000, very, very early periods. Um, and uh, basically, uh, I, it was thought that this was predating art on the walls, and so that um, three-dimensional art was seen as a slightly easier way to approach the world than two-dimensional art because it was less abstract, that you could carve something uh, and it didn't take as much uh, brain power as some, putting something in two dimensions. I don't know if this is true or I'm not. I'm having a hard time agreeing with that, but... Fair enough. That, that was a theory. There were a lot of weird theories about these things. So um, we find these, these, these figurines uh, tending to be earlier than the paintings, and so we say this is, this is the order things happened. It might just be that these figurines were really convenient to make. You could carry them around. And they're made of stone. And they're made of stone. or, or So they last. Or, you know, ivory or antler or some of these other things that if you put them in a cave, they'll last. Um, these ideas were then sort of revamped when we found some cave art that was contemporaneous to the carvings and it turned out that people were indeed significantly older yes. in a, well no not the ones not the ones in, in Indonesia but in Europe we found cave paintings that were the same age as these so mm. again this whole theory went down there was all sorts of theories some people thought it was all about uh, male and female images and putting them together for for mystical reasons there was people thinking that they were um, practice uh, you know that certainly that is something that you can do with your imagination if you're a uh, an athlete and you you uh, Think about putting a ball in a basket before you try, you will do better. And so this is something that athletes have learned how to do. They can, they can, they can uh, use their imagination to practice going through something and they have measurable improvement v because of it. Visualizing the activity actually Absolutely. stimulates the areas of the brain that you need to actually do that thing. So the ritual aspects of these things may well have been coupled with actual improvements in, in, in hunting skills, right? So one of the questions I ask my students is, uh, what evolutionary purpose does art serve, right? And it, so in addition to communication, it might actually give you some sort of an advantage to be able mm. to picture an animal that you're then going to hunt. You might be communicating it to other generations. This is the thing we hunt. But you might also be practicing stabbing at it. And sometimes you actually find stab marks on, on, the, on these animals. <laughs> and you'll see a place where someone so stabbed it with really a spear. So it really is practice. Other times, there is no way they could have maneuvered a spear into that position, but they're still stabbed. So it might be a ritual killing, right? So you, someone might have, might have taken a stone and jabbed it from close by, not the way they would actually be hunting, but uh, just to show that this thing had in some way been killed. Mm -hmm. The animals are often shown fat. Sometimes they're shown pregnant. 
These are things that are producing meat for the group. And so that, you know, that might be simply the reason they're important. Um, it's really interesting to think about their connection with shamanic practices. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we're talking about something 30,000 years ago and comparing it to something where we talked to 19th century shamans and we have an idea of what they were up to, or even modern shamans. We have some idea of what a shamanic journey might be. Some of the best information we have is uh, in uh, Native American peoples like the Mayans um, actually have living shamans that can help explain the hieroglyphics from six, 700 years ago. But even that is barely touching 30,000 years. Even if you go back and you read the Egyptian stuff from 5,000 years ago, that's barely a clue at what might have been happening. So everything that we're talking about is going to be speculation when it comes to reasons. But we can see that connected to how we have made art for a very long time is ideas of our own spiritual transformations, our own spiritual journeys. Uh, you know, Egyptian art has lots of animal-human hybrids where we're taking on energies of certain animals and trying to use them for our own purposes. Uh, and so uh, this is likely to be something that was happening uh, in these caves. Can't say it for sure, but you see similar uh, activities. There's a, there's a famous, uh, there's a famous uh, painting on a cave wall called The, uh, the Hunting Accident. And they thought that a, um, a bull had... Uh, run down a, uh, a hunter and the hunter had stabbed the bull and you can see what looks like loops of intestine coming out from underneath the bull where the bull has been stabbed and the hunter is lying on his back and it's called the hunting accident. Except, where is this work of art? When is this? This, 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 is, this, is, this is European. It's, it's, it's at uh, Lascaux. So it's, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, 16,000 years old, something like that. Okay. Uh, France. Okay. Um, and uh, it's, it's the early versions of it uh, you know, we're, we're, we're emphasizing, you know, look, it's a bull. The guy lying on his back is basically a stig fi stick figure, um, and he's been run over. And it was just sort of a thing that might have happened. Uh, but if you compare it to, uh, say, Shan, uh, uh, that, that's a, a hunter-gatherer group in, in Africa, they do modern rock carvings, and they'll often show a bunch of animals with a shaman lying on their back. And they can say, this is a shaman lying on his back, so this is direct with the animals that he's dreaming. And so the shaman dreams the fertility of the animals. And uh, this may be what we're seeing in, in this art. So this, this guy lying on his back. So it's not a hunting scene at all. It's not a hunting scene at all. Or he, it may not be a hunting He's scene. dreaming the animals that will be hunted. And this is being painted on, 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 on the wall. And it's a vision. And so one of the hints that he's not just being run over is he has an erection. And so on this stick figure, you know, it's not a lot of details, but you can definitely see that he's not just lying there imagining this thing. And so uh, one, of, one of the uh, ideas that may be happening is either through um, chanting or drumming or some other uh, uh, rhythmic trance-induced state or even uh, use of some sort of hallucinogen. Uh, many of these images have relationships to these, these hallucinatory trances. So uh, the Shan uh, art showing the shaman lying down, he's got one knee up, so you can't tell. Uh, but uh, he, he may well also have an erection. And this is something that's common with uh, a, a number of hallucinogens uh, in the trance state is, 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 is also uh, uh, sexual. So, for example, if, if you look at Taino art uh, from uh, the Caribbean, uh, there'll often be a shamanic figure who has uh, taken uh, some sort of hallucinogen and you see him with his head back as, as the muscles in his neck are tightening up from, from, from that state of being. He's got the smile, the rictus as he's grinding his teeth and he's got a big erection. And so this is a, a classic look of, uh, of, of the shaman in, 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 a, in, a, in a trance. Uh, and what these animals may, what may well be is objects of this trance. And so uh, you see uh, many of them are just dots. And so one of the ideas of what, uh, say, a, um, uh, a shaman in, uh, in Siberia might see is they might see dots swirling in their mind and that these dots then coalesce into animals. And so often on the cave walls, you'll see lots of dots. Sometimes you'll see animals made of dots. And then you'll see an animal made of dots with an outline around it. Is the idea that the shaman is 
is trying to call into being a good hunt? Is that what something like that, that but you... also communicating with it, right? So this is this is this is the dream time. This is the world of of the ancestors. This is the world of the animals. So this is you, right? These So so even in the time that these works of art were being made, they were depicting something ancient from their mythology. Perhaps Again, I am in full speculation mode yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. you know, I'm trying to say that this is what shamans do, right? They visit the world where the animals live. They bring the animals to be hunted. But these are also relatives of theirs that they're talking to. These are ancestors. These are relatives. These are, these are, these are beings that they're in communication with. Uh, and that this is done through the trance. So they're, they're you know, sometimes it's, it's members of the tribe have a totem that they're becoming that animal. Other times it's, you know, the animals that they hunt as a, as a group. But this is a, a common thing where uh, also the animals go into the shaman. And so this might be also depicted in some of the art, just like in the Egyptian art, they take the powers of the animals into themselves. Very often in cave paintings, you'll see a human with an animal head. And so sometimes these are called sorcerers and then other people say, well, we have no idea. I agree. We have no idea. But one reason why you might want to put an animal on a person's head is they've taken that animal into themselves. And so again, in this sort of shamanic trance version of it, again, very speculative, you could imagine these things as taking the powers of the animals and then uh, becoming uh, one with them as, as part of their power. So in Chauvet, in this, this very early cave from, uh, you know, Aurignacian period, maybe Gravedian, uh, you see groups of lions on the wall. And then this is particularly interesting because these are groups of what look to be female lionesses who are the hunters of the lions, right? So these are the hunters. This is female power painted on the walls of these caves. Now, uh, people have pointed out you can't tell. The cave lions might not have had manes. You can't tell if they're females. But I will tell you, you do not get large groups of male lions together. You only get groups of female lions you know, in, a, in a pride. The males will just fight. So there might have been one or two males. You can't tell in that picture. But when you see a group of lions painted on a cave wall, you are looking at female power. Okay, And as part of this evidence right in the center of that same room, in this very, very back area where the, where the ritual is happening, you have a Venus figure made out of a stalactite. So she looks like a, an actual uh, carved Venus figure, except she's not just a carved Venus figure. One leg is a bull, a minotaur, a, a bull's head on a man's body. The other leg goes up into a lion. So you have a lioness, the female power combined with the male power as the bull, and they look like they're having sex. Basically, uh, the, the, the female is slightly bent over and the male is behind her, and they look like a, 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 a sex act happening between a minotaur and a, and a lioness person. And if you get at the right angle, you can see it also looks like a yin and a yang. The, 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 the male is dark because of the paintings of the bull and the, and, the, and the lions are sort of a lighter tawny color. And so you get this kind of combination of the light and the dark. Uh, and then the whole thing is forming this goddess. And so it's very difficult to interpret something like that outside of a ritualistic are kind there of images of this. Yes, yes, there are. Uh, I, uh, Werner Herzog did a lovely uh, piece on this uh, called. Um, what is it? Uh, Cave of Dreams. Gonna have to find. Yeah, you want to see that. You want to see that yeah. movie. Yeah, because not not a lot of people are allowed Cave, back there. Cave of Dreams. Cave of Dreams. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Not a lot of people are ba allowed back there, but it's a it's a it's an amazing amazing site. Um, I have not been back there. Obviously, I've just seen seen the pictures. Uh, so anyway, but these these are these are clearly ritualistic things, and you can see this development uh, happening within European art. It's probably happening other places as well. Uh, and you see it become more and more ritualized as time goes on. As you go from the Aurignacian to the Salutrian to the Magdalenian, you get to the later portions of, of cave art and you see more and more of these rituals. You get uh, ritualized burials. You, be, you start to see more characteristics of the animals. You see more life in the animals. So the animals uh, start to have expressions and feelings. Uh, and there's this general idea of development. We probably had it at other places at other times for a long time. So this, this, idea of development is definitely imposed on what we're seeing.
but there's still a progression. You know, e even if a lot of this is being imposed, the later stuff does tend to be better. So culture is developing over time, even if it's a very long time. These there's roughly you know ten thousand years within each period. So. These things are widespread. You see similar symbols in several caves over a very wide from Spain to France. So this is an identifiable culture with developments over time. Uh, and this leads directly into, you know, the Neolithic and moving out of the caves and putting these images on pottery. I personally love the Bronze Age because to me, these things look like sophisticated cave paintings put onto pots that I go see at the Met, right? So they, they're, 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 they're well thought out, but they're a kind of art that personally I can understand. I, I can, I can uh, relate to uh, these kind of symbologies. By the time you get to classical art, I have a harder time. One, I would have a more difficult time doing it, but it's been so formalized that you, 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 you lack the freedom that you see in these earlier periods. And so this is what I see modernity have going back to. The modern artists talked a lot about primitive art. I don't like that as a term, but they were going back to these, these, these uh, symbols uh, that are older than uh, what is seen in classical periods. So, uh, you know, sculptures were going back to uh, uh, pre-Columbian arts. Uh, they were going back to even before the uh, the, the Mycenaeans. Uh, some of some of the, uh, the the early uh, the early uh, idols like the uh, the stargazers. These are pre Bronze Age idols found in Greece. I, I carved one of those. That's the one with the with the uh, opals in its eyes. Mm -hmm. um, so these are images uh, way before the development of, of of classical art. And I think this is kind of what we're doing right now. We've we started by going back to the very earliest art, um, or sort of for earlier art, uh, with modernity. This is what uh, Picasso was doing. This this is this is what Brancusi was doing. Uh, this 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 is what um, uh, the, the the major uh, uh, sculptors of the day were going back to uh, some of the uh, the pre-Columbian work. Uh, and then we tried to go from there. And so art became faster and faster, always looking for something new. And now we've arrived at this point where we've lost. Uh, we've lost uh, any connection to time. And we started to lose connections to things themselves. And so uh, one, of the, one of the movements within sculpture right now is that we are uh, post-media. So you have things, uh, you know, in, 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 in the si 60s, you have, uh, you know, Marshall McLuhan uh, saying things like, uh, you know, uh, the medium is the message. We've now transcended that to the point where there is no medium, there's just message. And the message could be... Uh, just put on a, in, a, in a projector and, and project it on the side of a building. You don't need to have actually anything made there. But that is a medium. In, in, you can't not have medium. That's... I, I know. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy uh, statement in, in some ways. And this was you why I wanted to... Um, I, I, I see where it's going, but how do, you, how do you have a message without a medium to carry the message? You can't convey the message. Okay, so this is why I wanted to get to Marina Abram... Can I say her name? Abramovic. Abramovic. Yes, Abramovic. Um, the other article in the Times uh, was uh, by this woman. There was an interview with her where she was describing her art. And she is a conceptual uh, artist who does performance art. And so this is art without a thing. This is art that is just a, a, an activity. And she described as art as the highest form of communication doesn't have an object anymore. And so, uh, you know, art doesn't have an object at its highest form. So just like those people with the hand axes were able to make a hand axe just looking at the person next to them without talking, we've almost returned to this earliest moment where uh, her idea of the highest art is not saying anything at all, changing what is inside yourself, and then having an impact on the person you are looking at and changing them. And that you've now lost all mediation. So it is like the disciple going to see the master and sitting next to the master meditating and learning directly from their body what energy is directly from their body, how, how this flows in them. The art is the spirituality. The art has become the spirituality. And so she has, is seeing this as, as the highest point in art. And I do agree with her. And I think, again, this is at the moment when art is completely broken, right? It's become nothing at all. But, but you can't, because you, you cannot transmit it except to one person at a time. Well, you could if, if, you're, if this is a video, right? So someone could see this happening. There's, there's no reason why but there can't trans, be... But that transformation, though, doesn't that require personal interaction with the artist in this case? 
Well, imagine a video of someone making a hand axe, right? Someone else could make a hand axe simply from that video, right? So there is a, maybe, it, it is possible. So there, there, it, there, it, it is possible to record these things. But yes, these are outside of time. It could be a performance on a stage and the whole audience is watching what this mm -hmm. thing is. So this, this is communication prior to language. Mm -hmm. This is communication at its most essential. And I agree with her that that is the highest art, being able to just put something out there. But I also think this is the end of art because there is nothing being made, right? There, there is no further thing. So this is what I was talking about, how things sort of destroy themselves and become the next step. We are now outside of time and we're outside of matter. We have left the ability to have a time. We've left the ability to even, even, even make things. And so we're at a moment in time where we are a moment and where artists are still making things but they now have sort of this new meaning. And I, I, I sort of wanted to talk about that. So in my own art, the art itself is about time and I'm making it in a medium that is purposely surviving. Uh, my wife, Wendy, is doing similar things with her cave art. So she is taking pigments, making them herself, she gathers from, from, from the cliffs and then paints that uh, in, the, in the style of cave art because these pigments will never, never fade, right? They are, they are, uh, they're iron oxides. They, they can't go anywhere. Uh, they, they will not change uh, over time. Uh, same thing with my jade. It, it, it really is stable. It's not uh, chemically active in any way. It will just sit there for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And so the art itself is about time. It's referring to earlier periods of time. Uh, and it is about something that will last. So we've gotten back to a medium. It's not exactly the medium is the message. The message is being conveyed within the medium, but it can, can be conveyed to you know, the future. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand the moment we are in time uh, and, the, and what has happened to art as a whole. And I think it has, uh, I think, I, th I, I think, I think, uh, you know, Abramovic <laughs> is correct uh, that we have uh, transcended the matter of art entirely, uh, which is why I think it's time to start making art out of stone again, uh, <laughs> you know, and. And so you are. Yeah, and so I am. And so this this is something that uh, you know we had left behind up 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 until really uh, the Renaissance. Art was made out of stone. It was carvings. It was statues. It was right, 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 right through that period. Now there was obviously art up on cave walls, but the but the statues that people made those those Venus figures were uh, always going to be the most precious possession you could actually carry. You can't carry around a cave wall. Um, and so uh, the, the idea of, of arts as things that you would have had always been stone. And it was only uh, really when we get to paintings in the Renaissance where the, uh, the Medicis and such can put their paintings up on the wall and paintings are being bought that uh, you get the commodification and, of right, painting and itself. And people can't have it. And other people can't have it. You know, later we get, we get the museums where the people now are allowed to see these things. Napoleon, uh, you know, is bringing these things in, into being where, where, where a nation can show off its, its, its loot, literally, uh, that it is gathered from other places, not necessarily with its permission, uh, and then put it in a museum for everyone to see as a display of strength, right? So art be, it starts to form these, 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 these other kinds of, of uh, abilities, but it had always before that been a way of sending a message in time. So Pericles talks about uh, the highest form of art isn't stone, it's the, it's the things we say to each other, it's the memories we pass on. But he was saying that everyone knew that stone was the highest form of art. <laughs> he was trying to show how, how we can transcend that. That, you know, if you want to be remembered, get yourself carved in a piece of stone. And that's what the Greeks did, right? And the only way you get yourself carved in a piece of stone is if you tell really good stories. You tell really good stories. So he was trying to draw that kinds of connections. Uh, but it was only uh, after the Renaissance that paintings became important. Uh, carving has been sidetracked, particularly hard stone carving. When we did carve, we carved in marble. Uh, but these hard stones really last better. Uh, they're just very difficult to make big. Uh, and so people liked big. Art became something that you had to make big, had to put on a wall, and wasn't something that was carved out of jade that you could put in your pocket. But uh, jade was always seen as sort of the, the epitome of, of, of value and lasting value and of the art that you could carry with you in is, many, many is, cultures. Is the, from, is, the, is the Chinese understanding of jade similar to that? That is the Chinese that understanding, is, yeah. but it's also the, the Mayan understanding. Uh, uh, jade artifacts were the highest thing that you could you could put to an offering. If you broke it, which took a lot of effort, a broken jade axe would be a a 
tremendous sacrifice that you had made. Uh, mm. So th these these things were were definitely the highest forms uh, uh, of art at the time. So I'm trying to reference these kinds of things in my art, but I'm trying to then relate it to uh, a, a, a much longer history, particularly uh, looking at the transition from, um, say, Neolithic to Bronze Age kind of works, mm. uh, which for me have the most uh, lasting symbols, right? These where the sun symbols come from, where the Venus symbols come from, you know, a, 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 a simply a, a, a star looking like a compass rose uh, was forever the symbol of Venus or, 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 a, uh, or a moon, right? These, these are, these are uh, symbols that we understood as uh, integral to who we are as, as, as humans, and we've carved and painted these things forever. And so this is the kind of stuff that I think we need to become reconnected with both matter and time. And, we, and I'm trying to do that uh, through my art, but through an understanding of, of human evolution and our, our relationship to, to, to uh, our, own, our own history and, 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 and time. Fascinating. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. See you next time. <laughs>